an inscrutable masquerade. In a drawer, in the bureau of an upstairs room of my current home, there is a locked cedar wood box, which I inherited as a youth from my grandfather. This is, one might say, my box of secrets. When I was young, it contained the treasures of boyhood, a catapult, a lump of beeswax, the carapace of a crab. For many years since, it has been the repository of an archive, admittedly a ragged and disordered archive, a collection of notes and scribblings concerning some of the many cases of my lifelong friend, the consulting detective Sherlock Holmes, which, for one reason or another, I never took the trouble to write into proper reports. Having had recently a little time on my hands, I reopened this box of yellowing notebooks, and it seemed to me that several of the cases, given the ocean of time between those events and the present day, would now bear telling. And I begin by chronicling an adventure which I may have dismissed for several reasons, not because it lacked baffling and intriguing elements, on the contrary, but mostly, I think, because it was for me personally such a dizzying and distressing experience. It was a Wednesday evening in July, at the end of a day of straight-jacketing heat, and I sat next to the open window of our parlour at Baker Street, drinking in the air and hoping for the liberating ripple of a breeze. The newspaper on my lap reported the release from police custody of a known criminal, Tobias Organ, arrested some days previously for the murder of Max Zimmerman, a moneylender shot through the head in his small apartment in Wardour Street. In the end, there had been insufficient evidence to charge Organ with murder, even though the police clearly thought him culpable. Strangely enough, I had once met Organ myself. He had come to me as a patient suffering, as I recall, from a severe lesion to the lower back, which he maintained had been caused by a fall against a metal stanchion, but which I had little doubt was in fact a stab wound. My diagnosis was supported, I believe, by his barely-veiled threat that I should under no circumstances make known his injury to anyone else. He had an unforgettable, menacing way with him, and I had felt immense relief when he left my surgery. I'd been looking forward to discussing the organ case with Holmes, who would certainly have some views on the subject, but when he finally appeared for dinner he was irritable and uncommunicative, and from these symptoms I guessed him to be in the process of some taxing mental work. All the same, I had no wish to sit out the meal in silence. "'Stifling weather to be out and about, Holmes,' I said, peppering a slice of beef. "'Indeed, Watson, and equally stifling to be in.' He busied himself with cutting into a potato. After a while I said, "'I've not seen you today. I presume you were somewhere on business.' "'Yes, Watson, I was.' Another pause the chink of cutlery. Somewhere local? Somewhere very local, Watson. I'd expect you'd like to know where. Well, I, I, I've no wish to be intrusive. In the basement. I've been all day in the basement of our house, and since your desire not to be intrusive is clearly struggling against your overwhelming curiosity to know, I will tell you why I was there. And he paused and smiled, in the full confidence that you will not breathe a word to a soul about it. "'Why, Holmes, of course not, and on the understanding that if I do tell you, "'you will not be able to leave this house until my work is complete.' "'What?' "'I put down, almost dropped, my knife and fork. "'You don't mean not leave at all?' "'That's precisely what I mean. "'So it may be that you would prefer to forego my secret "'rather than consent to becoming a prisoner here for what might be several days.' "'Hopelessly intrigued?' I gave no thought to the discomfort of being shut indoors in this sultry heat, no thought to the boredom, not even any thought to the fact that I had appointments in my diary. I am prepared to abide by your request, Holmes. He stood up from the table, his meal unfinished, and went across to the hearth to retrieve his pipe and tobacco pouch. As he filled his pipe and lit it, he sank into his armchair. I believe you have been preoccupied with the case of Tobias Organ, Watson. Yes, it has been on my mind. How? You twice left the newspaper open at that page. The moneylender Zimmerman, a legitimate businessman with a wife and young children, was murdered with an army rifle. The police have many reasons for believing Tobias Organ to be guilty of the crime, and one of these is that he owns an army rifle. 
Organ, of course, denies that his firearm is the murder weapon. Well, yes, I said, one would expect he would. But suppose, said Holmes, suppose there was a science which could with certainty tie a bullet to the gun which fired it. Well, that would be marvellous, I said. But there isn't, is there? Well, Watson, let us say that such a science is seminal. It is exactly this problem which I am wrestling with at present in the basement of the house. I've set up a laboratory of sorts down there where I can conduct some experiments. Progress is promising, and if the results are as I expect, they will certainly send Tobias Organ to the gallows. But Organ is an utterly ruthless villain, undoubtedly guilty of a number of murders, but devious enough always to palm them off on others. If he were to gain even an inkling of my work, we would be in the utmost danger. I can see that you would be in danger, Holmes, but how might I be? As I say, Watson, Organ is ruthless. To get at any enemy, his favorite trick is to abduct someone close to his adversary, often with, I'm afraid, horrific consequences. You know too much now, and since I'm not prepared to put you at risk in that way, I fear you must sit it out in these apartments. You must not answer the door, you must stay away from the windows, no visitors. You must lead the life of a prisoner until such time as this matter is settled. Well, I said, it might be good for me. I have a medical paper to write, and the period of confinement might induce me to keep my nose to my studies. Excellent, Watson. I'm sure your sacrifice will not be in vain. I really did not see myself sacrificing very much at all. I spent the evening cancelling all appointments of the following week, and went to bed rather looking forward to a few days of fruitful incarceration. The morning found me in a hopeful mood in what appeared to be an empty house. Holmes, I presumed, had already descended to his basement laboratory. Our landlady, Mrs. Hudson, had left me a pleasant, cold breakfast, an indication that she herself had had to leave the house early. The day, while already warm and bright, had not yet begun to turn oppressive. The clock over the hearth ticked slowly, as I settled down to my books, experiencing for the first time since my student years some of the quiet ecstasy of study. By midday the room had become hot. My concentration meandered, and thirst plagued me. I wandered downstairs to Mrs. Hudson's apartment and found her still absent, so I proceeded down to the basement to ask Holmes whether he knew what arrangements had been made for lunch. The door to the basement was shut, and when I tried the handle, I found it to be locked. From within, I could hear the occasional crack of what sounded like a gun being fired, and the grind of metal on metal like ball bearings rolling round an iron bowl. Holmes, are you there? Watson, what are you doing here? I'm in the process of an investigation. Indeed? Yes, I'm trying to find out what's happening about luncheon. You'll have to prepare something for yourself, he called back. I'm afraid I've sent Mrs. Hudson away. I cannot risk the lives of innocent people. And Watson, be so good as to keep away from the basement. Confine yourself to our own rooms and to the kitchen. There's a good fellow. Very well, Holmes, but yes? I really would very much like a newspaper. I'm afraid you must do without. Neither of us can take the chance of leaving here until this business is complete. Now, please, let me get on. I trundled to the kitchen. I managed to find myself some bread and cheese, which I took back upstairs. Our rooms were now very hot, and since I was forbidden to sit near the window, I ate my luncheon over my books, dropping crumbs into the creases of Grey's anatomy and beginning to feel restless. After lunch, I managed to force myself to a little more work, but by three o'clock had fallen asleep in the armchair. I woke to hear the sounds of evening traffic moving along Baker Street. I listened with something like envy to the busy hubbub of those who were free to come and go, who had families to return to, and simple feasts awaiting them at convivial tables. My lot seemed bleak by comparison. Holmes did not emerge from his infernal basement, and Mrs. Hudson did not appear with an evening meal. I cannot recall how the rest of the evening passed. The heat absorbed during the day by London's pavements now radiated back to thicken the evening air. The world outside, of which I had no news, became gradually silent, and I, hungry and disconsolate, went finally to bed. The next morning, after a makeshift breakfast, I got down to some work. 
and was well into the argument of the paper I was writing, when I began to realize that the room was again beginning to become airless and oven-like. Determined not to succumb to lethargy as I had the previous afternoon, I decided that despite Holmes's strict embargo on going near the window, I simply must have some air. As I raised the sash, I saw a cab approaching along Baker Street and stopping directly beneath the window. The passenger who stepped out was Nicholas Cartwright, an old university friend now writing for the Times. I hadn't seen him for a couple of months, and he seemed about to pay a surprise visit. Desperate as I was for company, I could not forget the promise I had made to Holmes to admit no visitors. The doorbell rang. My first idea was to wait for Cartwright to give up and go away, but there quickly came a second ring, and with it a call from the street through the now open window. Watson! A note of anxiety in his voice suggesting that all was not well. Cartwright was a good friend. I did not see how I could linger there pretending to be deaf when he might be in need of my help. I dashed down the stairs and opened the front door. Watson, so pleased to have found you. The statement immediately struck me as odd, as did Cartwright's whole demeanour, but mindful of the proximity of Holmes in his makeshift laboratory, I whispered, Look, old chap, odd things are going on. Come up, as quietly as you can, I'll explain there. A sudden sharp crack issued from the depths of the house, and I hoped that, preoccupied as he was, Holmes would have no inkling of the presence of my visitor. As we entered the parlour and shut the door, Cartwright said, "'Watson, I've been worried about you. I didn't even know if I'd find you here.' "'Worried? Yes. The story in the Gazette regarding yourself and Mr. Holmes. Did you know it was in the papers?' "'Cartwright, I haven't the least idea what you're talking about, and as for newspapers, I haven't seen one in days. Here.' He tossed me the paper, open at about the third or fourth page, and I read the following headline and accompanying article. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson part company? After several years of celebrated collaboration, the eminent consulting detective Mr. Sherlock Holmes and his medical companion Dr. John Watson have terminated their professional partnership and it seems simultaneously ended their personal friendship. Mr. Holmes said that while he continued to hold Dr. Watson in high esteem, and to regard him as a man of exceptional honour and professional competence, circumstances upon which he could not and would not elaborate had made it expedient for them to go their separate ways. <laughs> there was no comment from Dr. Watson. I stood for a moment, holding the newspaper and averting my gaze from Cartwright. Who had written this? Did Holmes know about it? Was there some truth in it? Was Holmes's exile to the basement a way of keeping me at bay while he found alternative lodgings? This is today's Gazette? Yes, Watson. I see you knew nothing about this. Am I speaking to you as a friend, Cartwright, or as a journalist? Well, I suppose, unfortunately, as a friend, John. I say unfortunately because this is clearly a damn good story. But if you wish to talk to me off the record, so be it. Off the record, then. I know nothing of this. And I don't know whether Holmes has had a hand in it. He's conducting some very secret business at present, and possibly it's connected to that. That's all I can tell you, I'm afraid. One thing does baffle me, Cartwright said. How did the Gazette get the story without us getting it too? Anyway, I won't make anything of this, John, until you give me the go-ahead. But I hope if there does turn out to be an exclusive... You'll be the one to get it, I said. Thank you, Nicholas. I saw him down the stairs and closed the front door behind him, finding myself relieved that he had gone. I had no idea that I would be singing him again soon under even more peculiar circumstances. But determined that now I must confront Holmes with this business, I knocked on the door of the basement. Holmes! A long silence. Holmes! We must speak. Not now, Watson. Holmes, there's something I must discuss with you urgently. Something in the newspaper. There was a scuffling and the basement door opened. Newspaper? How did you get a newspaper? Cartwright called. He'd seen an article. Yes, Holmes interrupted. Yes, the article. I dare say you would appreciate an explanation. Give me half an hour. 
A little later we sat opposite one another in our sitting room. The evening was still close and oppressive. The newspaper article, said Holmes, was an unfortunate necessity. I hope it has not caused you too much embarrassment, Watson, and when this business is finished, all will be rectified. But why, I said, report us as having quarrelled? Bear with me, Watson, I beg of you. As you know, I have tried to keep my work here secret, but how certain can one be of that? The police are involved in these matters and are aware of my experiments, and who knows whether some junior or even senior member of the force is not in league with that utterly ruthless villain. Now, having been alerted to that newspaper report, might it not be the case that Tobias Organ would assume that you were no longer in London? At any rate, he would certainly be likely to assume you were no longer sharing these premises with me. You gave the story to the Gazette to protect me? Yes, Watson. That was my purpose. I just wish that you'd consulted me first. You were not supposed even to know about it, Watson. And if you had not had a visit from Cartwright, you would never have seen the article. It was unfortunate that he came when he did. It was the article that brought him. Yes, a miscalculation on my part. Now, it is late, work to do tomorrow, and I must insist on extracting from you another guarantee. What's that, Holmes? that you will not, under any circumstances, interrupt my work again. It's all very delicate, and a disturbance at an inopportune moment could ruin everything. Is that clear? Not under any circumstance. That night I lay awake in the muggy heat, the bedclothes pulled back and grieved for what I calculated to be the death of my reputation. At least I imagined that's how the world would see it, or at least that portion of the world that reads the London Gazette. Holmes and Watson have parted company, but there is no comment from Watson, only a nobly worded valediction from the great detective. Such bitter thoughts polluted my restless waking and tormented my subsequent dreams. And added to all this, there lay a sense that things were still not clear, that something crucial remained unspoken. I woke early, but exhausted. Without going near the window, I took in what I could of the wakening day. The street was quiet. I dressed slowly and descended to the kitchen to find something to eat. The rattles and sharp cracks of Holmes's experiments had already come to life below in the basement, and I wondered whether he had even bothered to go to bed. I was making a pot of tea when the doorbell sounded. The noises from the cellar did not pause, so I assumed that Holmes had not heard the bell. I could see nothing of the front of the house from the kitchen, but after I had taken a few steps up into the lobby, it became clear by means of a side window that the visitor was once again Nicholas Cartwright. I went to the door and admitted him. Cartwright? What's going on, Watson? What do you mean? I mean, what game is being played here? Cartwright? I've no idea what you're referring to. you better come up. He was, I could tell, steaming with anger, though I had no idea what I could have done to arouse it. He would not sit. He stood with his arms behind his back, a man preparing to deliver an accusation. You told me you were inescapably confined to this house. Yes, Cartwright, and so I have been. This is the third day. Excluding yesterday night, you mean? No. I was here yesterday night, too, tossing and turning in my bed at the thought of my ruined reputation. Watson, see here. Yesterday you prevailed upon my friendship by confiding in me matters which, as a journalist, I considered more than worthy of publication. Had I known that you were deceiving me, Cartwright, you have my word, I was not deceiving you. I have not left this house since Monday afternoon. So you have a twin brother? No, I do not. Then please explain to me, who was the man outside the restaurant at Marlebone Station at five past midnight? I take it he resembled me. More than resembled. I do hope you're being truthful with me, Watson. I could see that his suspicions were not allayed. I even began to wonder whether my restless period of waking the previous night had itself been a dream, and whether I had been sleepwalking. Such things are possible, I know, and the heat, my fatigue, and the events of the last days had left me so baffled that in that moment of confusion I could not entirely rule it out. 
What happened, he said, was that I was walking through the station concourse when I spotted you by the wall of the restaurant, which by then was closed, talking to a man in a brown felt hat. I would have approached you, but when I caught your eye, you cut me as dead as if you didn't know me, and I assumed your conversation was of some importance. The more I thought about it, the more I thought it was a poor way to treat a good friend. Suddenly the fog in my brain gave way to an horrific clarity. I knew that I must rid myself of Cartwright at once. Thank you for telling me this, I said. It is of the utmost importance. But Nicholas, and I pray you won't take this amiss, I must ask you to leave. To leave? Please. This is a fearfully serious business. There is real danger. You're not just trying to get me out of the way, Watson. That's exactly what I'm trying to do, Cartwright, but for a very good reason. Believe me, you will have your story. <sighs> very well, John. Very well. At the front door, he patted me amiably on the shoulder. I shut the door on him and leaned against the wall, trying to get my thoughts in order. Holmes had instructed me not under any circumstances to trouble him again, yet this situation was possibly critical. If Tobias Organ had hired some impersonated look and sound so like me that even Cartwright, who had known me for years, could be convinced, then Holmes might also be deceived, and then what power they would have in their hands. If I could not speak to Holmes, I could at least alert him by other means. I ran up the stairs with the idea of writing a note which I could slip under the basement door, but as I reached our rooms, I heard a cry from the street. Without thinking, I ran to the parlour window. A hundred yards southwards, along Baker Street, three men were struggling. Two of them were bundling the third man into a cab against his will. It was Cartwright. I dashed down the stairs and ran into the street. The driver of the cab had already whipped up the horse and moved off at a lick, but I gave chase, fury and outrage, fuming my progress. I pursued them for a good half a mile until eventually they outpaced me and I stood gasping for breath outside St. Vincent's Church. I sat on the pavement. I needed Holmes's help. The transgression of a broken promise was a trivial thing, surely in the context of this appalling incident. I would go to him immediately. Aware that in the haste of my pursuit I'd left the front door of the house open, a new anxiety overcame me. Clearly this kidnap was the work of organs ruffians, and who was to say that they would not take advantage of an open door? I trotted as briskly as I could back to Baker Street. But the door was no longer open, and on such a close and windless day I thought it unlikely it had been closed by a draught. The horrible thought occurred to me that someone may have already got in, and then everything seemed to tumble into place. Cartwright's abduction had been intended to draw me out of the house so that the man masquerading as myself could gain entry. Holmes would be unaware of this. He would eventually open the door of the basement to his assailant, and believing it was myself he was admitting, would offer the easiest of targets. I had left the house without a key, but I knew there was a possibility of access via the rear of the terrace. This entailed my knocking at the door of our neighbour, Mrs. Harbin, an elderly, amiable woman who seemed happy to allow me access to the rear of the building. Here I was obliged to scale a wall to the yard outside the back of our own dingy basement, the front room being that which Holmes had taken for his makeshift laboratory. There was no light within. I opened the door with infinite slowness. The noise of Holmes's experiments seemed to have stopped. The door that connected this room to the front half of the basement was six or seven short paces away, but it was too dark to see whether the bare floorboards were liable to move and groan when I trod upon them. I tested each step before lowering my weight and moved with the floating motion of a rather overweight pantomime artist. One, two, three. Then there was movement behind me. A hand was clamped across my mouth and an arm locked around my throat. The grip was expert. I could not breathe or move. The hot breath of my assailant in my ear whispered, 
Doctor, do not cry out. I'm going to release you and you will turn round slowly and face me. You must not make a sound. Tap my hand if you understand. I reached up to the hand around my throat and obediently I tapped it. The arm released me, and as quietly as I could, I took a deep draught of air, turning as I did so. Lestrade! Shh! Yes, Doctor. Wasn't expecting you here. Or rather, in a sense I was, but since you are just about to arrive, I wasn't expecting you to come in the back way as well. The policeman smirked at his little conundrum. Will you explain to me? I began. What on earth you mean? Not now, Doctor, he said. Glad you're here, though, sir. An additional pair of ears. Up close to the door now and listen, it won't be long. It was indeed less than a minute before we heard the door from the front of the house opening into the laboratory and the arrival of what sounded like two men. The door was closed with a thump and a gruff voice said, So this is it? Yes, this is where he's working. There was something familiar about that second voice. And he won't be back for a while? No, half an hour, I should think. At that moment, with a shock, I recognized the other voice. It was my own. I turned to Lestrade again, but he just put his finger to his lips and indicated that I should continue to listen. So what's the plan, then? asked the gruff voice within. To match the bullet that killed Maximum with the ones from your gun, said my voice. The police know you killed him, but they need Holmes to provide them with evidence that will convince a jury. Evidently, I thought, the gruff character is Tobias Organ. I heard him pace about, then spit noisily. Zimmerman's not the first one I've topped, and they've never got me yet. They say you only got four pounds ten shillings from him. Never you mind what I got. Anyway, I never killed him just for the money. I killed him because he gave me a bad look. He gave me a bad look, and I gave him a bad headache. A bullet right between the eyes. Now, let's deal with this little problem. Suddenly there was a tumultuous crash, as if one of the walls had fallen in. In we go, Doctor, said Lestrade. He pushed the door hard, and we rushed into the laboratory, where Organ had kicked Holmes's equipment flying in all directions, and where, to my amazement, I saw that he was now being attacked by myself. A perfect duplicate of me cracked him a right hook, then a left hook, and then felled him with a blow to the side of the head. Organ hit the floor like a sack of cabbages. Lestrade was on him in a flash, cuffing Organ's arms behind his back. Lestrade blew his whistle and then proceeded to arrest him. As I stood back to get a better look at my other self, the duplicate doctor put a hand to his own face, wrenched at his upper brow, and pulled and stretched until he had removed his entire face, revealing beneath the peeling mask the flaming eyes of Sherlock Holmes. The next moment Lestrade's officers came bursting through the basement door, and Tobias Organ was dragged away. The heat of the day had given way at last to a pleasant evening. Mrs. Hudson had returned to the house and provided Holmes and myself with an excellent evening meal. Now we sat with our brandies, and Holmes with his pipe at the open window, where a gentle breeze lifted the curtains and refreshed the parlour. As you will have deduced, Holmes was saying, by way of explaining it all to me, the object of the masquerade was to lure Organ somewhere where we could extract a confession from him by subterfuge. But your ballistics experiments, I said, would they not have been enough to convict him? It is a science only in the imagination, Holmes said. And though one day I'm certain it will be more than that, there is much more work to do than I could accomplish in a fortnight. But Lestrade and I agree that if Organ believed himself to be at risk from my experiments, he would wish to destroy them. But what on earth were you doing in there, Holmes, if the thing was a complete hoax? I'm afraid I did deceive you a little. I was not in there all the time. The mechanism of an old railway clock and a device employing elastic and a drum skin were intended to give the ear the impression of ongoing industry. Well, it certainly deceived me, I said. But was it really necessary for me to be incarcerated for the duration? I'm afraid so, my friend. If Organ through one of his spies had got wind that there were two Watsons, the trick would not have worked. 
What's more, it was necessary for him to believe that you and I had quarrelled, and therefore that the good Dr. Watson might be in the market for a bit of betrayal. Unfortunately, your friend Cartwright saw me meeting Organ's accomplice at Malibone Station, and almost let the cat out of the bag. It was necessary for us to put him somewhere safe. Lestrade's men kindly subjected him to a temporary and very comfortable period of kidnap. It was you who had him dragged away. Yes. I had not calculated that you would follow him, of course, or that you would be locked out and find yourself clambering in through the back. But it turned out well. You will make an additional witness for the prosecution. Do you think they'll convict him? Oh, yes, Watson. His confession today was as clear as a bell. Tobias Organ will hang. As for you, my friend, I have given you a terrible time, and as a reward, I am going to take you to the opera. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Gilbert and Sullivan. The Mikado. But, Holmes, my memory is you don't much like Gilbert and Sullivan. No, Watson, but you do. And besides, I have to confess to having a soft spot for the Lord High Executioner. <laughs>